Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Matt. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to share um, the learning experience I had when I set out to make a one-hour public television special about the Holy Land, because I know there's a lot of caring Americans, but there's a lot of Americans that are really steep on the learning curve when it comes to some really important areas. And by the complicated nature of the uh, politics of the Holy Land and so on, it's reasonable for a lot of us not to really fully understand it. And I wanted to go there with my TV crew and figure it out so, because I feel responsible. We are stakeholders in the Holy Land. Our government invests more per person for Israeli individuals in, in that country than they do for Americans in this country. You know, I mean, we are part of the equation, whether we like it or not. And as a taxpaying American and as a Christian, I feel a responsibility. I, I, I need to take an interest in it. I strongly believe that we need a military, and there are times we need to use it, and I also strongly believe that for every bullet that flies and every bomb that drops, my name is on it, because I help pay for it, and I would imagine you do too. So it's a, it's a fun challenge for me to di distill into a little more than an hour uh, a dual narrative approach to the Holy Land. Dual narrative is really important. I'm not here to be pro-Palestinian, are here to be pro-Israeli. I'm pro-peace and understanding and live together. And there is a solution there. And as a journalist with public television, I have a responsibility not to abuse the bully pulpit any more than I do as a tour guide on a bus with people for two weeks when I'm the only guy that gets to hold the mic. <laughs> I've learned that 30 years ago. You just cannot, have, you gotta be careful about abusing the bully pulpit. And uh, with our public television work, we really have to be careful to offend people on both sides about equally. <laughs> and we did it masterfully in our one hour special. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of give you a, and I know there's people here that know the Holy Land better than I do, and I certainly don't claim to be an expert, but um, I'm pretty good at distilling things into a simple package so people who are steep on the learning curve can go up on a little more, and then we can all be a little more insightful and a little less easy to manipulate by media that is designed to manipul manipulate us. And I won't go any further on that, but you can imagine <laughs> what a challenge it is to fully understand the Holy Land. The Holy Land is, um, it, the Israel is 12 million people. It's about 20 or 30 miles wide, about 200 miles tall. It's about the size of the Olympic Peninsula, all right, up in Seattle where I live. 12 million people, half of them Israeli Jews, half of them Arab, mostly Muslims. Now, that's 12 million people, half and half. Israel itself is 8 million people. 6 million Jews, 2 million Israeli, Arab Israelis. We've heard about that in the recent election because they're starting to get active in Israeli politics now. That's a little, little peek into the future, and I'll talk about that later. But a big part of the Israeli electorate, assuming they're a democracy, is not Jewish. 2 million out of 8 million, okay? Now, when we think about Palestine, and I've chosen that word carefully, many people would rather I don't say Palestine. I wrote an editorial that aired all over, the, or that was printed in newspapers all over the United States. It could not be printed in the Los Angeles Times because it used the word Palestine. You see, I made a TV show that I'm talking about. It never aired in New York because it calls Palestine Palestine. There are strong interests here that want to call it the occupied territories of the West Bank or Judea and Samaria or whatever. Okay? This is an example of the complexity of writing a script in the Holy Land that you want to get out and have a lot of people read or see, you see. But I decided to call it Palestine because that's what the people there call it. The, the four million people that live in the green area call their country Palestine. And the family of nations has agreed to call it Palestine whereas the United States has yet to call it Palestine. Okay, so um, God has an interesting sense of humor <laughs> by putting the most holy place of the three great monotheistic religions on the same spot, th this rock here, covered by this dome of the rock. It's the most holy place for Christians, Jews, and Muslims 
or one of them, the very holy place, okay? And uh, when you travel there, it's the complexity based on everybody historically gathering around that holy spot. Um, excuse my voice, I've got a, a little throat problem and I'm just uh, not as fully voiced as I usually am. Um, when I was in the Holy Land, I saw little Palestinian kids with toy guns shooting imaginary Jews. And I thought, that's not nice. And then I saw little Jewish kids with toy guns shooting a mal imaginary Palestinian terrorist. And I thought, that's not nice. And then I thought, but in all fairness, when I was that age, what was I doing? I was shooting Indians, communists, Japanese, and Germans. What am I saddled with? The same thing their parents are saddled with, the parents' perspective, right? Every Christmas, I got a gun. My parents gave it to me, and because I'm a white, capitalist, Christian, American, I had predictable enemies, and they were the same enemies as my parents. Maybe you can relate to that. Well, in the Holy Land, it's really important that we get both narratives. We've got that baggage. We've got the baggage of our parents. Why am I Lutheran of all denominations? Does it have anything to do that my grandparents came from Norway? <laughs> I think so. So we have to be honest about that. We have our parents' baggage, good and bad. Well, when you travel, you want to get both narratives. If you ever are blessed enough to take a trip to the Holy Land, you owe it to the experience to aggressively be sure you have both narratives. If you're going with one or the other, you're going to get a lopsided point of view. I know that from traveling anywhere in troubled parts around the world. You buy both newspapers, the left wing and the right wing. You go to Palestine and you go to Israel. You have Israeli guides and you have Palestinian guides. And then you have to synthesize it. That's what you have to do. So you talk to wonderful Israeli peoples and you gain uh, an appreciation of that perspective. And then you talk to wonderful Muslims and Arabs, and you get a, a perspective there. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I think we need to have that. The modern story of the Holy Land is kind of, uh, and I'm not, forgive my, uh, I'm, this is very simple stuff, it's very complicated, and if there's scholars here, you can have your money back. Um, <laughs> but I'll just simplify it the way I understand it. You know, um, after, after World War II and the Holocaust, there was a lot of uh, interest in having, uh, letting Israel be a Jewish homeland. And uh, today, Israel has as many Jews in Israel as were killed in the Holocaust. It's a, it's a big threshold, which is pretty exciting. And in 1947, modern Israel was established. What a dream, what a beautiful thing. The survivors of the Holocaust, still in their concentration camp uniforms, hoisting up the flag of modern Israel, thank God beautiful thing. I get excited about it. I love it. The, the slogan was, a land without a people for a people without a land. Isn't that beautiful? How perfect. There's these vacant sand dunes in the Holy Land that the Jews really care about. We can ship them all there and they can have their country. Great. But the fact is, there were people there. <laughs> There were lots of people there, and they had been there for thousands of years, and they were kicked out. And that's the difficult side of that great, wonderful Jewish story. All the refugees that were pushed away, away from their villages. And since then, we've got all sorts of bloodshed and promises and walls and, and problems. There's been so many caring people that have tried to sort this out. Um, Itzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, and Clinton. It was so close. And I've, you've followed it through the troubles in Ireland. There's all sorts of places that have these complicated issues. Great statesmen figure it out, and then people manage to let off a bomb in the middle, and all the people that were celebrating getting together are push to the extremes, and it radicalizes things, and they go back into their trenches, and they go back to point zero. Rabin and Arafat and Clinton, that was exciting. Today what we have is Netanyahu and President Trump. It's a different dynamic when you think about the hope for peace with the United States as the honest broker. 
It took about $100 million to shape President Trump's passions in the Holy Land from Sheldon Adelson, if I understand it correctly. And it was quite a reasonable purchase that that man made because he's had a lot of progress in the last two and a half years. Well, there's this wall. And this wall is built. You're not supposed to call it a wall. It's supposed to be called a fence. <laughs> I got a lot, in a lot of trouble for calling this a wall because it's a fence. It's a security fence. And it was built by Israel to protect them from terrorist incursions. And I know from a Palestinian point of view, you don't want to hear the word terrorist, but there's a reality. When America thinks Yasser Arafat, we think terrorists. If you're from Israel, you think you're worried about terrorists. You're not, you're not worried about soldiers without uniforms. You're not considering them freedom fighters. It's clear to me, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. It depends on whose side you're on. In the United States, we used to be the terrorists. If you look honestly at our civil war, it's the only way when you're hopelessly outgunned, you don't get mowed down. People who have the, the uh, advantage with the uh, military strength say you should play by the rules. You should stand in formation and march toward us so we can carpet bomb you. <laughs> but people who are hopelessly outgunned, they shoot in from the bushes like we did against the redcoats in the revolution. You know, you can call that Nathan Hale, or you can call it a terrorist, depending on which side of the, the equation you're on. Today, we are the redcoats, because we're on top. We've got all the power. So it's a complicated thing. But when you look at that wall, it was built by Israel to defend themselves against violence coming in from the West Bank. But the unintended consequence of that wall is it keeps those kids from talking to each other. To me, that is the tragic thing. Those kids don't want to fight. They don't want to be buried in all of this stupid, non-productive bickering. They want to get on with life. You see it in Haifa. You see the Israeli and the Muslim kids in Haifa. It's a, it's a modern sort of Palo Alto kind of town, I think, in the Holy Land. And uh, it's very cool. But the, 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 the traditional people are dug in. They're raised by parents. They've got religious traditions that don't eat, even let them share the same food, almost cynically designed so people can't break bread together. You know? And of course, they've got this ridiculous, unfortunate wall. So it's an exciting story, the creation of the modern state of Israel. And it's an exciting story when you go to the West Bank to see people saying, welcome to Palestine. Here's a flag. I was very touched by that when I traveled in the West Bank. Welcome to Palestine. I heard that everywhere I went. Welcome to Palestine. By the way, I'm not talking about Gaza. Gaza is a whole different story, and I'm incremental on this, and I didn't want to lay too much on my public television audience, so I just stayed out of Gaza. It's a horrible mess. We can be much more angry or militant or activist or extreme about that if we wanted to really get into it, like progressive people that care about peace and justice but I'm not talking about that. West Bank and Israel. Okay. Um, so since 1946, you can see how Palestine has shrunk. The green is Palestinian-controlled land, and the white would be Israeli-controlled land. So we had the fun of going there I went there first to scout, then I came back with my TV crew. We spent 16 or 18 days. Uh, we had uh, Israeli guides when we were in Israel, Palestinian guides when we were in Palestine. A one-hour script is 6,000 words. It's tough to tell the story in 6,000 words. Try to tell anything complicated in 6,000 words. And um, it was a beautiful challenge. You can watch the show, by the way, anytime you like for free on my website. Just go to ricksteves.com and look in the TV section, you can see our Holy Land show, you can see my current fascism show, you can see our Iran show, you can see my Christmas show, all the different, my Martin Luther show. We produced a one hour special on Luther and the Reformation, which I was very proud of. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so we think about that, that, that 
sacred spot that everybody is climbing on over each other, you know? It's amazing to think that a third of humanity sees this as a very important spot. A third of humanity. Of course, for Jews, this was the site of the Temple of Solomon. This is their most holy place. In 70 AD, 70 years after Christ, the Roman Empire destroyed the temple, destroyed the Jewish community there, and that was the diaspora. Jews then scattered. There was nothing, no possibility to stay there, and you got the whole planting of European Jewry at that point. Um, uh, today people still go back to, to worship at the Western Wall. It's not even a wall, it's the foundation stones. This was underground back then. There's nothing left except what was underground. Okay, in the same spot up above, you've got the rock upon which um, Muhammad took off when he journeyed to heaven. This is very important for Muslims. And of course, right next door, you've got where Jesus was crucified. So there's so much going on. If you get a chance to go to Jerusalem, it's one of the most exciting cities to ever visit. And what I felt when I was in Jerusalem is people were um, cool. I just loved it. It was, it was a celebration of the complexity and the diversity and the different heritage, different faiths. I thought it was a rich, rich experience. The old city is corralled in a, in a, in a, a medieval wall, and it's got four quarters, the Armenian quarter, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. And uh, each quarter has its own personality, and it is well worth checking out. One thing I think Jews and uh, 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 Arabs aren't quite aware of is how much they have in common. Everywhere I went in the Holy Land, whether it was Israel or Palestine, people were introducing me food like it was theirs. <laughs> and I didn't want to say I had the same thing on the other side of the wall. <laughs> I, I even understand, you know, in, in the whole European area, in the Mediterranean, everybody is crazy about soccer, what they call football. There's no big soccer team in the Holy Land, so they adopt a European team to root for, like somebody in the United, if you lived in Idaho, you'd probably root for the Seattle team or something like that. You know? <laughs> and the Israelis root for the Barcelona team. <laughs> and the Palestinians root for the Barcelona team. <laughs> they don't even know it. They don't even know it. <laughs> in all religions, there are fundamentalists. Christians have fundamentalists, Jews have fundamentalists, Muslims have fundamentalists. I love the fact that there's different religions, but I don't love the fact that there are fundamentalists. To me, a fundamentalist, that means I'm right and you're wrong. And I don't think anybody can, can live their lives like that. If, if you do, you're going to have trouble. And of course, there's Christian fundamentalists. As I said, there's you know, crazy extreme Muslim fundamentalists and there's extreme Jewish fundamentalists. As a traveler, when I go to Jerusalem, I love to go to the, what do they call it, um, ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. Not just Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, because you see Judaism in its extreme. People are, all the different kind of clothes and symbolic things that they wear and the very strict lifestyles that they have. Um, it's fascinating. When you go to the ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods, try to go on a, uh, what is it, on a Friday, right? Because on Saturday, it's the Sabbath. And it's just everybody is scampering and do everything on Friday because you don't do anything at all. I mean, they take the Sabbath much more seriously than most of us Christians do. Um, it is interesting in the Holy Land that there's three Sabbath days, Friday for the Muslims, Saturday for the Jews, Sunday for the Christians. So if you're, if you're very devout, you don't work very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you walk down the street, you walk down the street in San Francisco, you see pop stars, you know. Here, in an alternate orthodox number, you see super duper rabbis. <laughs> pop star rabbis, really. And these are the, they're on people's home, they're on the wall in people's bedrooms and kitchens and so on. And uh, it's just quite an interesting experience to check out. Half of the uh, six million Jews in Israel our first generation, first generation. And every Israeli Jew is required to go into the military when they're 18. Not every Israeli, if you're an Israeli Arab, you don't, they don't want you in the military, right? But if you're a Jewish Israeli, you do. Most of the Jews turning 18 don't speak Hebrew. They don't know their heritage. 
they go into the military, and that serves several purposes. It's for defense, it's a source of cheap labor, and it's a way to uh, acclimate newcomers to the culture. They learn to speak Hebrew, they go on field trips to learn their heritage, and when they come out of that, they're Jews, you see. So it is quite interesting when you, um, you see a lot of military people that are just uh, uh, fresh off the boat, or whatever you call it. If I, I saw this sign, and it, it was very interesting to me. This is a typical sign when you're in Israel, four languages. You got Hebrew, you got English, you got Arab, and you got Russian. Russians there because there are so many Russians that get the opportunity to come to Israel. Israel has a program, a welcome home program or something like that, where anybody of Jewish heritage is the, the red carpet's rolled out for them. It's, they're subsidized, they're welcomed, they're funded. Uh, the people who were kicked out of there in 1947 wonder about where's my welcome home? My family's been here for 2,000 years, but uh, the people that have never been to Israel and don't speak Hebrew get that because it, 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 it uh, invigorates the populace. So I was there on the um, national holiday. They've got a 4th of July, on a, just on a different day every, day every year. And it was exciting. I love to be in countries on their 4th of July. It's just barbecues in the park and everything. What's, what's poignant about Israel's 4th of July is a couple blocks away, you've got this wall. And on the other side of the wall, every time Israel's having its 4th of July, the Palestinians are marking another festival, which is called the Day of Catastrophe. Because side by side, you've got the winners and the losers of that war. And on that day, that was the beginning of the tough times for the Palestinians, who feel like they're living under occupation, who feel like they're living in a cage, who don't have much control of their world. So filming this was so exciting. I just, I just love this kind of work. And um, I'm so thankful, by the way, for public broadcasting, because we could air that show. That show would never see the light of day anywhere else on the dial. Even in public broadcasting, all over the country, when we ran our show, people were emailing their TV stations saying, how dare you give voice to the enemy? We're going to take you out of our will. That'll teach you. <laughs> and public television will not be extorted by people that want to stand between us and learning about the world by traveling. Public television. So, if we weren't raising money for Bright Stars of Bethlehem right now, we would do a pledge drive. <laughs> but I'm really thankful for, you know, what do you have, KQED and uh, San Jose Public Television, what is that, K KQED, yeah. That's just really so important because of the complexity of the challenges that we're all trying to figure out and how clever people are at confusing us. It's nice to have one place on the dial that is not um, held hostage by the sensibilities of their advertisers. Yeah. That's when you come right down to it, what shapes the media, that shapes our outlook, it's advertiser needs. Because without advertisers, you can't get air, except in public television. So just as a matter of civics, consider a pledge drive a blessing. <laughs> So Tel Aviv is an amazing city. It's about 100 years old. It feels like San Diego. And it's a wonder, there's this wonderful fiction that it was built on those sand dunes, you know. And it's just an amazing story. And today you can go, the, the very first buildings just are from the turn of the last century. And there's old parts of town, which is quite exciting to see. I love Tel Aviv. It's a beautiful city to check out. Um, we traveled around Israel, and there's so much, and I would highly recommend when you're traveling in Israel or Palestine to have a local guide. Spend the money for the local guide. Picnic for dinner if you have to. But there's a lot of very good guides. They speak English, and they would love to show you around. And it's just, if you can at all afford it, it gives you much triple the experience in half the time. We were lucky because we had uh, Benny, who was, uh, he was the former PR press agent for the Israeli military. So he knew the party line, you can imagine. And he would take us around, and we learned a lot from him, and, and he helped us show the Israeli perspective. I learned a great respect for having the high ground. Israel needs the high ground. This guy's a military guy. He explained why Israel needs the high ground. If I was Israeli, I would insist on the high ground. 
Before 1967, was the Six Day War, 67, um, Arabs had all the high ground. And, and the day before the war broke out, Arabs were saying, fish, don't, don't eat dinner tonight because tomorrow you'll be munching on two million Jews. We're going to push him into the sea. That was broadcast in Hebrew. You know, it was scary times. And Israel was putting up with the fact that their enemies had the high ground. So 1967, Israel, what a brilliant war. They destroyed Egypt's air force when it was still on the runway in Cairo. I mean, it was over before it started almost. And after that, Israel had all the high ground. And Israel remains controlling the high ground today. This is the Golan Heights here. You've heard the word Golan Heights. This is a Syrian pillbox. And for a generation, it was lobbing mortars down on Israelis in their kibbutz. The kids were down there working in the farm. It was like Boy Scout camp for them, you know? And uh, they never knew when a, when a mortar was going to hit them because the Syrians had the high ground. Now, it's a tourist attraction, and there's, there's a cafe up there called Kofi Annan, named after Kofi Annan, you know, the, the United Nations guy. <laughs> It's, people go there for, you know, to look into Syria and to cluck and cluck and enjoy having the high ground. I think Israel should have the high ground. Uh, I think both countries need to be secure and stable and uh, with dignity. There's got to be a solution there, but Israel wants the high ground and for good reason. When you look out over that, you just get a sense of the value of coming here yourself and gaining an empathy for people on both sides because it's a complicated issue. Now, Israel has, Palestine has this West Bank, and over, since 67, Israel has gradually moved in half a million people, 500,000 people live in the West Bank in gated communities on hilltops. These are called settlements. They are as beautiful and wealthy as a gated community here in California. Beautiful security, wonderful lighting around the perimeter, inside good people dreaming of a nice neighborhood where they got good Jewish friends where the kids can go to good schools with nice Jewish teachers. It's kind of, you swap out Christian and it, a lot of us would like that, you know, it's that kind of comfort. Um, so all over the West Bank you got shepherds that are Palestinian in the valley floor and you got the previously unused hilltops with these gated communities with wonderful infrastructure so people can commute to work in Tel Aviv. Remember, it's just I mean, it's, it's, it's 20 minutes at 60 miles an hour in the freeway, and you're on the other side of the country. It's 20 miles across. So you get around in a hurry if you've got good infrastructure, and if you're Jewish and you don't have border crossings. Palestinians have border crossings. So they can't count on getting anywhere in a hurry without the good graces of the people in the, in the border crossings. And those border crossings, there's flying border crossings that just set up anywhere. Um, so this is a shot in... Ireland. And I show this because I want to talk about settlements. When a powerful country tries to get its way politically by moving people in and planting them in enemy territory. Russians did their best to dilute the population of Estonia by incentivizing all the retired military to live in Estonia because Estonia is just a million people. You spend, send in a couple hundred thousand Russians and Estonia will dilute and you won't have that problem. Didn't work. Today you've got an underclass of Russians that is a persistent problem that Estonia has to deal with and the Soviet Union is long gone. England went down to Sri Lanka for their tea, Britain, a long time ago. Local Sinhalese people wouldn't pick the tea cheap enough. So what do the nice Christian uh, English do? bring in darker people from Tamil Nadu who will work on the plantations for half the price. And England gets cheap tea. Don't be too disgusted because we get cheap bananas for the same reason from Central America. But um, that's how the British did. And then when they were done colonizing Sri Lanka, they decided to move out and they left that country with a dark underclass, Tamil Nadus, and an upper class that was the, the people who were there first. And the Civil War after that happened because of English tea. Uh, in Ireland, the most Catholic part of Ireland used to be the North, which is the most Protestant part today. Historically, that was the heartland of Irish Catholicism. What does the King of England do? Well, let's move uh, settlers from Scotland. We'll give them extra money, we'll subsidize it, and we'll protect them, and we'll plant them, get a foothold in Ireland in the North. 
600 years later, or I don't know how long, but centuries later, what do you have? Heartbreak, heartache. Who's paying the price? People many generations later. You can't just have indigenous people. You can't just wish them away. Who are the poorest people in Guatemala? It's just down there. The people who built those temples, the indigenous people. They're the poor ones. They're in the lousy land. Who gets the low land? The ancestors of the European conquistadors. So when you go to Israel, when you go to Ireland today, this is uh, in Northern Ireland, Derry, you see in the Catholic neighborhoods, Palestinian flags flying. And when you go to the Protestant towns, you see Israeli flags, flags flying. Because Protestants have an empathy for Jewish people in the Holy Land because they have, they're paying the price of governments before them that planted them there. And Palestinians have an empathy with Catholics in Ulster because they're the indigenous downtrodden people. It's fascinating. Planting, planting people. So these people are planted behind that fortified wall. I was impressed by how easily we could get in there. I, I really wanted to get into a settlement with my camera crew came up to the gate. I said, hi, we're an American film crew. Would it be all right if we just went in and took a few pictures? Make yourself at home. We got nothing to hide. <laughs> so we went in there and I was playing with the kids in the parks. It was wonderful. Uh, we went into uh, the malls and the, and the, you know, the commercial areas. Uh, they were just like you'd, what you'd find here, uh, except the only graffiti you saw was pro-Israeli graffiti. This is a guy named uh, Herzl, and he was the original Zionist from the 19th century in Austria, and he's celebrated. Uh, because Zionism is the whole reason why we have Israel, that notion of having all the European Jews go back to their original homeland. So when you talk to people in these settlements, the half a million people living in the West Bank who are not uh, Palestinian, they're there for all different reasons. This family here was there for religious reasons. This is, they're God's chosen people. They're supposed to live here. The name of the place is called Samaria and Judea. And they're having as many kids as they can. They were so thankful that they were doing their duty by having ten, eight kids. And they were very smart people, very wealthy people, and they told us the story, and they had that perspective that they're planting the, so, the, the flag of Israel because they, it's part of their religion. Okay. Uh, this man's family was in the West Bank because it's a way to get away from it all. You could see the stars at night. You can go, you know, you're in the great outdoors. It was a beautiful way just to get back to nature. That was a beautiful reason to go to the West Bank for an Israeli. And uh, these young guys were there because they had condominiums that were subsidized by the government. They could not afford to live in Tel Aviv. So they get this incentive to live in a settlement at a subsidized rate with a brand new comfortable house and air conditioning, all that, security, and then a freeway that takes them to work in Israel. So that's, there's different reasons you might want to be a Jew in West Bank. And there are people who really believe in establishing just Israel without this Palestinian problem that really see this as a future toehold when they want to send the non-Jewish people to uh, Jordan. When you build an Israeli house, the, first, the most important room is your safe room that can't be hurt by a sniper. And you can just identify an Israeli building because it's got those safe rooms. If you're a Palestinian, you can identify the Palestinian uh, apartment complex by the black water um, containers on the roof. A reminder that water politics is quite aggressive and, and quite harsh. And Israel controls the water. And if there's something going on in Palestine that Israel doesn't like, they just turn off the water. And then you've got a little water that you've squirreled away on your roof, and it's heated because it's black, and black attracts the heat and so on. And you can get your shower and so on. But you hope that Israel gives you back the water because they hold the spigot. But you see water you know, hydrants and stuff around the West Bank, and they're always with a a cage and big locks, and nobody gets at it without Israel okay with it. Uh, I like this poster because it just says, tourism in Palestine. Come and see Erez is, er, Erez Israel, whatever that is. But uh, this is the Association of Jewish Guides. I mean, this is 100 years ago. If somebody tells you there was no Palestine 100 years ago, it's, it's baloney. There's been Palestine called Palestine by people who are Palestinian for 2,000 years in the Holy Land. But now there's this, yeah. So these are my, two of my favorite guides, Abi and Kamal. 
And uh, Abi is a, a Jewish guy from Jerusalem. Kamal is a Christian Muslim guy, a Christian Arab guy from um, Bethlehem. And, um, you know, he, I don't think of him as a Christian. I think of him as a Palestinian, whether he's Muslim or Christian to me. He just lives like a Palestinian. Uh, the interesting thing, they're both great guys. They really connected with each other. The problem is they just can't see each other because one of them lives on one side and one lives on the other. We had a hard time finding a place where they could both park their car so I could walk from one to the other. <laughs> we found this. It was in a restaurant, in the parking lot of some restaurant. And uh, I, I really was happy to meet him. They changed cards and everything, and then, and then we were on our way. Um, but the interesting thing is you could bicycle from where Jesus was crucified to where Jesus was born, I think in about 20 minutes. You just, you just bike it. It's, Bethlehem is like a suburb of, Jeru of Jerusalem. But the people who live in Bethlehem like Kamal, cannot go to Jerusalem, and the people who live in Jerusalem, like Abi, cannot go to Bethlehem. I know more about what's going on in those places than they do, because as a tourist, I can go to both of them. So if you're taking a trip to the Holy Land, this is one of my frustrations. A lot of Christian groups go to the Holy Land, and you know, America, how, how freaked out we are about safety. It's kind of silly. Have a safe trip, you know. It's never been safer to travel than right now. Never. I've spent four months a year in Europe for the last 40 years. There's no reason that people think it's dangerous now except for the media. They're just made fools of by the media, and most of us just embrace it. When somebody tells me have a safe trip, I'm inclined to say, well, you have a safe stay at home. <laughs> because, because where I'm going, Statistically, and I know statistics are optional these days, but where I'm going, <laughs> statistically where I'm going, and that's almost anywhere, is safer than where you're staying. So why are you telling me to have a safe trip? Fear is for people who don't get out very much. The flip side of fear is understanding. We gain understanding when we travel. Who are the most frightened people in our country? The people buried deep in the middle of it, with no passport, whose worldview is shaped by media. Those are the scared people. Who are the bold ones? I guess it's those of us who have passports and a curiosity and enough money to go explore the world. I was just in Ethiopia. I was just in Guatemala. I was just in Russia. It's great. You know, my son lives in Colombia, Medellin. It's great. People freak out, but they've not been to Colombia. Why do they freak out? Because 20 years ago was the drug capital. They don't know what it's like today, but they still freak out, you see. So it's important for us not to be, not to let fear get the better of us. Because there, it, it's no holds barred politically in this country. And uh, man, we're being made a fools of in a lot of ways. So how did I get off on that? Um, <laughs> I was mentioning that when church groups go to the Holy Land, routinely they go all the sites in Israel and they make a little strategic beeline to the manger square in Bethlehem and then have lunch, see the place where Jesus was born in that old church, and then they go back to Jerusalem. Whew, nobody got us. <laughs> you owe it to yourself, if, you, if you're lucky enough to go to the Holy Land, to sleep in the West Bank. Yeah. Sleep in the West Bank. <laughs> it's much cheaper. It's the ec economic difference is like San Diego to Tijuana. It's tenfold. People make ten times as much money per capita in Israel as they do in, in Bethlehem. Okay, so you're going to have dirtiness. You're going to have broken concrete, rusty stuff. You know, they don't have enough money to clean up all the glass. You've got rusty uh, barbed wire. It's just, it's a rough and tumble developing world country that's in a, a crisis. But the people are beautiful, the food's beautiful, and I just, I don't know why you would think it's dangerous. It's just, it's, it's just poor, but it's not, and it's more edgy. It's, you're out of your comfort zone. And it might do that thing that Thomas Jefferson warned us about. Thomas Jefferson said, travel makes a person wiser if less happy. <laughs> because if you go to West Bank, you're going to ruin a lot of dinners when you get back home to your comfortable friends. <laughs> so this is a little town of Bethlehem. It's not so old little anymore. <laughs> it just feels like a big suburb of Jerusalem with a wall connecting it to the rest of the city. And in the middle of that, well, right at the wall, you see taxis waiting to take people across. It's just like any uh, connection between wealthy and poor countries. 
people looking for work here, people here want to have cheap labor. Every day, thousands of people go from West Bank into Israel to cut the lawn and change the diapers of the old people or whatever you know, immigrants do. You cross the border and you do stuff. To, uh, you can help out on the other side. So you got that dynamic going on, and tourists can just come in back and forth easily. So as a tourist, you'd walk across the wall, you'd hop in a taxi, and you'd go to your hotel 10 minutes away. The skyline in Bethlehem is crescents and crosses. It's very interesting. Um, there used to be more Christians in the Holy Land than there are now. It's just 1 or 2% of the population, I think. Bethlehem is a place where there are a lot of Christians. The Palestinian government has worked very hard to keep Christians in the mix. I understand that in a couple of major cities, and Bethlehem is one of them, the, rule, the law is the mayor always has to be a Christian. So, I mean, the trajectory is like this, and when there's one Christian left in Bethlehem, <laughs> it's the mayor. <laughs> um, so, this is the uh, Church of, of the Nativity, and on that same square there's a mosque that's been there for a thousand years. I think it's important for Christians to remember that Jesus and Mary are very important in the Quran. Uh, Jesus is a prophet, and Mary, there's a whole book in the Muslim Quran dedicated to Mary. The mother of Jesus. Uh, the, the, the big challenge for us is, in it, there's lots of prophets. Muhammad, for Muslims, Muhammad is the last prophet. Jesus is a prophet, and Jesus is fine and dandy, but Muhammad is the last prophet. Now, if you have a religion where your prophet is after 650 or whenever Muslim lived, whenever Muhammad lived, let's say you're a Baha'i, and you consider Baha'u'llah your prophet who lived in the 1800s. For you to worship him is blasphemy, and you can be killed. So is that nice? Not really. But is that OK? I would say, yes, it is. If you have a Muslim country that's not a democracy, it's a theocracy, and in your religion it's blasphemous to worship somebody after your guy, you, you've got the opportunity to not allow it in your country. If you happen to be a Baha'i in Iran, keep a low profile, <laughs> or leave. You see, a lot of us are just up in arms because of that, but I just think that's the way Islam is. And we're not going to change it. You can't tell them to mellow out. I mean, we've got Christians killing abortion doctors, you know. Mellow out, no, that's their religion. They're fundamentalists, that's what they insist on. So it's a complicated thing. But when you go there, you'll find a lot of tourists coming there, and that's where they go, right to the, Beth the main square, the manger square. And you go and you, you enjoy visiting the place where it's believed Jesus was born. But there's much more to Bethlehem than that. That what I found very interesting. You go into the commercial center, and it's all away from this 2,000-year-old Christian stuff. It's a, it's a thriving community. It's a very important part of a country called Palestine. And on the main commercial square, they don't have a lot of money for fancy monuments, but there's this monument. It's just kind of like a, on paper and on wires. but it, it is a memorial to all the young Palestinians who are doing life sentences in Israel uh, because they were involved in violent crimes. So this is, uh, you, you gain that empathy. You humanize this situation. You know, they were considered terrorists, so they're, you know, they're locked up forever. Uh, we've, we, we, we do the same thing in our country. Uh, uh, so it's poignant to go there and see that. Okay, so when you think about the West Bank, it's fascinating how you can get around. It's so easy to get around. There's so much fascinating history and Bible uh, history to see and so on. And um, from Jerusalem, obviously, you just jump over the wall and go to Bethlehem. And then, you know, a short drive to the south is Hebron, which is the uh, place where the prophet um, uh, Abraham is buried. And he's the uh, first... Uh, Arab and the first is uh, Israeli, right? So he's the common link between those two tribes, Israelis and Arabs. They have the same first uh, ancestor. Uh, and then you've got the Dead Sea, and up in the north you've got Nablus, and the de facto capital, Ramallah. So that's what we're going to look at now. Um, when you look at this, it's like 20 miles wide and 40 miles tall, three or four million people there. Four million, I believe, including Gaza. 
uh, this map illustrates the fact that there are three different zones within the West Bank. There's zone A, zone B, zone C. It's complicated, but basically, zone A are little islands of urban uh, Palestine. And th that's pretty much autonomous. Palestinians get to control their cities and run them the way they want to. But the vast majority of the land with almost no people living on it is uh, B and C. And that's just shepherds and roads, and that's controlled by Israel. So you can't build there, even if it is part of the West Bank, without getting Israel's OK. You can do whatever you want in those urban islands. But the rationale is, and it's understandable from an Israeli point of view, if there's bad stuff going on from the Palestinians, you can lock that whole country down just by shutting off B and C. Nobody drives anywhere. And everybody is in their little urban islands, and it stops any kind of activity. And that's what it is designed to do, and it's quite clever. When we look at this, you also notice Palestine controls no waterfront, not on the river, not on the Dead Sea, not on the Mediterranean. Palestine is landlocked, completely landlocked, no airport, no control of its borders. If you're trying to build an economy, you cannot have a trade fair. You can't have a meeting Tuesday at noon with anybody outside your country because you don't know if you can get across the border today because Israel can shut down the border just because they're shutting down the border today. Israel does very um, just mean-spirited things just to break the spirit of the people they are uh, threatened by. And one thing is these road stops. Just today, there happens to be a roadblock here. And there's three Israeli police. It's 100 degrees. There's a three mile long line of traffic. It's hot. Three Israelis, one is checking identity, the other two are sitting around drinking tea. And you just sit there and you cook in your car. And it's, is it for security or is it just to break the spirit of the people who live there? I don't know. I just won't, I won't venture. But if I lived there, knowing me, I'd be pretty upset. The wall is nicely landscaped on the Israeli side. And then on the other side, it's an art gallery. I like political art. I really like political art. One of my favorite things about going to Bethlehem is just walking along the wall and seeing the art. And trying to understand what would it be like to be living there. This is what our challenge is. We need to gain empathy. This is why, well, this is the beautiful thing about travel, is you gain empathy. You learn more about who we are by leaving it and looking at it from a distance. And you gain an empathy for the other 96% of humanity when you venture out there. I just love it. And when you go to the Holy Land, you gain empathy. So infrastructure is amazing when you're in Israel. I mean, the country has infrastructure that is every bit as good as ours. I, I, you could make a case it's better. It's like they have all the money in the world for this infrastructure. It's our tax money, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you get around in a hurry. You, and, this, and the infrastructure is blind to the West Bank and the rest of it, it just cuts right through it because they want to get from A to B in a hurry. And everybody gets to use it during good times, but during bad times, you have to have you know, the right license plate. Now, if you come to a Palestinian town, you've got a sign in red which says very clearly in three languages, this road leads into area A under the Palestinian Authority. The entrance for Israeli citizens is forbidden. It's dangerous to your lives and it's against Israeli law. I was told the reason for that, the reason Israel really cares so much is they don't want their people kidnapped and held hostage. There's a very easy way for Palestinians to gain leverage against Israel is to hold their people. So you don't want to venture in there. Tourists come and go quite easily. Uh, all cars have a license plate, color-coded. Half of them are Israeli, half of them are Palestinian. At a glance, you know who's who. And on certain days, uh, Palestinian cars are not allowed on the roads. Land. Land. Land is so fundamental. When you look at problems all around the world, and I've studied this as a travel writer and so on for 30, 40 years, it's land. We're told it's communism, you know, but it's land. And uh, Palestine is a beautiful country. 
I was just down in Guatemala, and I'm, I'm making a one-hour TV special that will air in January all over the country called Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned in Guatemala and Ethiopia. Because I've long been aware of what I consider structural poverty, structures in developed, undeveloped countries that keep them undeveloped. If you live in a country that grows peanuts, you can't make peanut butter because you'll make too much money off your natural resources. You've got to export your raw materials raw so we can make the peanut butter and earn the serious money. You grow coffee, you can't roast it. You, you export your beans green, you see. And that's just trade policy. If you have a generous trade policy in the, in the rich world, you would let people develop their resources there. If you've got an aggressive trade policy, you would forbid that. You don't make it illegal, you just make tariffs such that it's not viable to do anything but sell your bananas in bunches. And you can imagine how trade policy is being rejiggered in the last couple of years. I'm so interested in that, I've, and I'm just, I've had such a great experience making that, so stay tuned for that. It's, we're gonna be doing a lot of that in the next couple of months. Um, but uh, this shot is in Guatemala, and it's way in the high country, it's 10,000 feet up. Terrible, rocky soil. The great-great-great-grandparents of these people used to farm in the good soil, but now that's been taken over by coffee plantations and palm oil and, sh and uh, sugar, right, sugar cane. Uh, and I talked to people in indigenous organizations that just deal with fairness when it comes to land rights. And uh, this organization tries to help indigenous local Guatemalans, Indian Guatemalans, that um, just want to own their land. And that's dangerous work. Four of their colleagues have been killed in the last, in the last year uh, because of the work they're doing. And they told me, if you're a small farmer on good land and the coffee plantation wants to buy your land, they're going to pay you a fair price for it, but you've got to sell it. And they'll sit down with you and say, we can negotiate with you or we can negotiate with your widow. It's kind of up to you. And there's no law and order there because the elites control the government, own the government, and the United States supports the, gov the elites. So the indigenous people end up in the rocky soil way up above, trying to just scrape by an existence while the uh, oligarchy of eight rich families owns all the good soil. And then they grow crops to export to us so we can have bananas, coffee, beef, and bananas and that kind of thing. Just the banana republic thing, you know. It's the same thing. And when I first went there, I just, I wrote a journal called There's Blood on Your Banana. And it was a powerful thing I wrote, and I just had a need, and I physically gave it to every representative's office in Washington, D.C. I delivered 400 of them. They probably all went into the garbage can, but I had to do that because this is us. This is us. Half of humanity is trying to live on $5 a day. Half of humanity. One day's wages for your grande latte. That's pretty powerful. Um, and it makes wars. This is a monument in, in San Salvador. Looks like our Vietnam Memorial, doesn't it? I, I was down there demonstrating with the, remembering Archbishop Oscar Romero on the 25th anniversary of his assassination, marching with peasants, and we came to that. I said, what is, that's, that's our monument. Well, they said, it's your design, but it's the, the 65,000 people's names chiseled into that grat, black granite are our people, and they were all killed fighting the United States. We thought, we framed it as communists, you know? Maybe they're just communists and we gotta kill them all. Most good Americans just believed they were communists. It's unfortunate, but we had to kill them for freedom. But you go down there, and these people were trying to own enough land to grow rice and beans for their kids. And you don't, that's not allowed. <laughs> Imagine the baggage there. They lost as many people as we lost in Vietnam. And they've got five million people and we have 200 million. So that's a 40 to one grief ratio. Think of how we hurt with Vietnam, multiply it by 40, and then just shut up, you're communists and you can't do it. You know, it's just, it's powerful. That's baggage. That's what you learn when you go south of the border. And what's powerful to me is, you can't take a photograph of American embassies in these countries. I have a personal hobby of taking pictures of American embassies where all of my local friends freak out when I do. Don't do that, no, no. You can't do it. They're the most fortified building in these countries, and it's the American embassy. 
it's fascinating to me. It is so fascinating. And the more you learn about it, the more you curse Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so, it's land in the Holy Land. Land. It's just, we need enough land to feed our families. In the Bible, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, the Jubilee, every 50 years you're supposed to redivide the land and forgive the debts. It's explicit. Now, rich Christians know God was just kidding. He couldn't have been serious. <laughs> I mean, come on. What about capitalism? You know, we bought and paid for that land. I guess there's some wisdom in it. It takes about 50 years for things to get so out of whack that desperate people rise up and they have to be put down in violence. In Central America, every 50 years, 1830s, 1880s, 1930s, 1980s, peasants get so downtrodden, they rise up and they're put down. And it's land that's keeping the Palestinians down, I believe. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth, 1,400 feet below sea level. There's no way out for water. It comes in, and then it just um, evaporates, and it, it, it makes the minerals more and more thick. 30% of that liquid is mineral, and that's why we're so buoyant on it. It's 30% not salt, but salty stuff. Right? And it's a beautiful place to be. But you can't go there if you're a Palestinian, unless you pay $8 to go to the resort, because it's, the whole shoreline is owned by Israel. Israel c controls the shoreline. So I paid for my, is, uh, my Palestinian guide to get down there, but eight bucks to go to the wa water in the resort is not bad if you're a rich European or Israeli, but that's a lot if you're a Palestinian. The big commercial city in Palestine is Hebron, H-E-B-R-O-N. And Hebron is famous and important historically because it's got the tomb of Abraham. in a medieval Christian, what was a medieval Christian church. And it's a big teeming city of Muslims, Arabs, must be, I think, a couple hundred thousand people. And there's a small enclave of uh, very patriotic Jewish people, because you know, they want to be close to their patriarch also, Abraham. So they're not going to abandon that city to the uh, Muslims. So you've got a little contingent of and, and Hebron attracts people who are kind of enthusiastic about their heritage on both, in both communities because they want to be near Abraham. For a lot of people, it, they wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that important. But if you care about Abraham, you're quite extreme in your, in your faith, whether it's Muslim or Jewish. So you got the people, the vast majority is Muslims, but a small community in the high ground with more Israeli soldiers than residents, soldiers to protect them because you're surrounded. It's a very high energy, um, uptight town to be in. And when you go through the market and you look up above, you see all this garbage, which is famously thrown down by the Israelis who live in the condominiums above onto the Arab market. And, and then see so you walk down on below that with all the, the Arabs, and it's just kind of, it's just sort of bad for their brand to be doing that, it seems like. Um, Lots of these, you know, protective turnstiles, lots of anger, lots of potential violence, lots of Israeli soldiers that are just fresh off the uh, boat, you know, they're not even Israelis yet, and angry Palestinian women just barking at these poor guys. And then these guys are just sitting around having their tea and waiting for their next mission, and then uh, they go off and do whatever they need to do. It's a very uptight town. Uh, main roads are kind of closed down for who are between the different sectarian neighborhoods. And again, it's all about this, the, the uh, tomb of Abraham. And when you go to the tomb of Abraham, it's under this, the roof of this old medieval Christian church. The tomb's in the middle. Half of it is a synagogue and half of it is a mosque. Abraham in the middle. And when you see Abraham, it's, it's got bulletproof glass so people can worship two halves of his body. Muslims, Jews. In 1994, a deranged Israeli settler came in during a prayer service of Muslims and killed 29 people right there while they were praying at the foot of Abraham. And Palestinians have killed Jews in there too, to be fair. So it's, it's a very poignant place. And uh, uh, 
I just was privileged to go with my camera crew on both sides and film it. And always uh, up above, you've got the fancy uh, camera, and Israeli security is making sure they know what's going on. Deep in the West Bank. There's a lot of kind of normal Christian tourism. I go to the only, the only crowds of tourists I saw was at the Sea of Galilee, and it was just a traffic jam of tour buses with all these Christian groups going to, you know, um, where Jesus walked on water and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the Christian tourists you see in the West Bank are usually uh, progressive, liberal, activist Christians. And they're here kind of just keeping an eye on stuff. So there's that interesting psychological edge that way. Um, another important town is called uh, Nablus. And Nablus is, uh, I felt it to be a very exotic town. It's a town that is uh, famous for its kanafa. I don't, maybe a lot of you know kanafa, but I don't normally get all excited about a pastry, but this is so good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a flaky pastry with um, honey-soaked goat cheese, drizzled with all sorts of syrup, and then sprinkled crushed pistachios. And so nice. Um, kanafa. I did notice that we've got a lot of baklava waiting for us here. And baklava is nearly as good. And that's right here. So that'll be after the talk. Um, but uh, Nablus is known for a lot of um, freedom fighters or terrorists, depending on your politics. I did notice that there's posters caking the streets. Um, memorializing these guys who were killed in action. Again, terrorists or freedom fighters, depending. And um, I also noticed they were all old. I, I think the understanding in Palestine is violence is not going to be a winning solution. And that's an interesting decision that has to be made. And I think they've made that decision. And nevertheless, it is quite emotional to see these posters uh, and to think of what motivates these kids. What's the hopelessness? What is it like to live there? Ah, um, when you travel around, you see this key a lot. This is a, a rallying cry. In 1947, a couple hundred thousand, I think, um, people who lived there, Palestinians, were told, there's going to be a war tomorrow. You take your key, lock up, and get out of here. We'll let you know when it's over. So they left thinking they'd come back. They had their keys with them. And 50 years later, they're still not back. They're, they're gone, their kids still have that key, it's symbolic. They probably are in denial about the fact that their village has now been bulldozed and spark. You know, um, but uh, they hold on to that key, and you see that key, and you remember the dislocation caused in the Palestinian community by the establishment of a homeland for the Jews after the Holocaust. I mean, it's, it's complicated, there's no easy solution. There's no easy way to sort it out, but there is a solution in there somewhere. But there's a lot of people with their keys wishing they weren't living in what they consider is a cage. There's a refugee camp called Balata, 10,000 people in it. And these were set up, these refugee camps, right after 47. And everybody got enough ground for their tent. 10 years later, it sort of seemed, well, you know, we might as well get some cinder blocks and make something more than a tent. And 50 years later, you still get the same plating, but what you have is a very densely populated refugee community on the same spot as those tents with the same borders. And to wander through that is really powerful travel. And to film it is a beautiful thing. And uh, after this, just giving you this talk, I'm just thinking, I'd like to see the show again. I mean, please, if you have an hour, Get online and watch the show, because you'll, you'll enjoy it if you're finding any of this interesting. When you travel in a poor community like this, remember in the old days they had um, cyber cafes for people to go down to the corner and get online? And Well, of course, now there's no cyber cafes because everybody's online at home. You don't need a cyber cafe. But in poor countries, you find cyber cafes because people don't have money to be online or have the gear at home. So they have 50 cents. They go down and the kids play for a few hours in the games in the, in the, in the neighborhood cyber cafe. So I went in there, it's nice to get to know the kids, merhaba, and I would take their hands, and one little kid turned around and said, F you, rich man. Oh. You know, I mean, he didn't say F you, he was much more explicit. And I, and I just, I thought, well, here's a sophisticated young boy, you know, that was, he understands there's some injustice here, and here I am, caring, coming in, you know, with my 
with my round trip ticket, and he's going to be stuck there for all of his days. A lot of people say Palestinians just teach their children to hate. And I asked Palestinian parents about that, and they said, you know, it's hard to teach our kids not to hate. That's our challenge as parents, is to teach our kids not to hate. Because they know what's just over the border. They know what it's like not to have water this week. They know what it's like when dad is stu stuck in a made up traffic jam. They know how ironic it is when you think of the heritage of the people who are inflicting that occupation on them. It's a fascinating thing to witness firsthand. The de facto capital of Palestine is Ramallah. It's a beautiful town. It's on high country, so it's cooler than the rest of Palestine. There's always a breeze. It's the cosmopolitan town. You hear a lot of American accents because a lot of American Palestinians feel like it's a good time to go back to Palestine, and they want to be in Ramallah because it's a cosmopolitan town where you can live a kind of a Europe Western lifestyle instead of those other towns I showed you. I called it the de facto capital in my TV show. Why would I call it that? Well, the government's there, the, the commercial, the big business is there, uh, the tomb of Yasser Arafat is there, all the government buildings are there. Um, it's the de facto capital. But they don't want you to call it that because that's giving up on Jerus East Jerusalem being their capital. That is the one dying hope of Palestine, is to be able to have a little bit of it, Jerusalem to be their capital. And uh, the last two and a half years have been horrible in that regard. If you want a two-state solution. If you don't believe in a two-state solution, it's, I guess it's good that you're shutting off opportunities for that. I said your. I should have said we're. Because it's us. It's not the rest of the world. It's not Israel. It's us that's calling the shots in that regard. There's a university just outside of... Um, Ramallah called Birzet. It's got 10,000 students. I love going on campus in countries all around the world, especially in, in difficult corners of the world, because that's where I find hope. And to go to Birzet, you can see how this society, Palestine, could actually be a contributing part of the family of nations, proud, represented, in the game, hopeful, with a, with a, with a young generation that plays by the rules, if only it made sense to play by the rules. And you hear it and you talk to kids in this university. I just loved it. On my website, by the way, I, we did a lot of interviews during this show that never got aired, but they're just DVD extras. And I talked to these uh, co-eds for half an hour. It was a fascinating discussion. And it's, it's on our website. If you ever went to the TV section, you just click, you could listen to their discussion. But. Um, I'm fascinated by Americans that are so put off by Muslims who make their women cover their head, you know? Um, they don't, when, in some extreme cases, they, the, the women are forced into that, but generally, it's a, women, a woman's choice. And I asked these three girls, you know, they're good friends. One of them chooses to cover her hair and the others don't. I asked him about it and, you know, do you all laugh at the same jokes? Yeah. Do you go to the same parties? Yeah. Why do you wear a scarf and you don't? Well, I feel I get more respect on the street when I don't show my hair. It's just, in a Muslim sensibility, you're not supposed to look sexy at a woman who's not your wife. And if somebody dresses really exciting, it's a problem. And women think if they cover up and they don't have a revealing outfit, less people will look at them in a sinful way. It's an option. When I was in Iran, I noticed there's no cleavage, and Orthodox women would cover everything, no hair at all. If a girl wants to be naughty in Iran, she lets a little bit of hair tumble out of her scarf. <laughs> and after, after two weeks in Iran, I gave up looking for anything exciting below the chin. <laughs> there's just nothing there. And I learned to get excited about a little naughty hair. <laughs> it, it was really fun, because it actually became pretty sexy. Um, <laughs> So you've got that, it's just the fun of travel, is to learn about that. But um, you know, the, the two girls were laughing at or joking with their friend because she's got, I asked her, how many scarves do you have? And they said, she said, 80 or 90. And, uh, and then she talked about how you never wear a pattern with pattern, it's always got to be solid with a pattern or solid with a pattern. And they put a little um, yogurt cup 
like an empty yogurt cup right here to make the, the, it puff out a little bit in the back, and that gives it a little extra kick. So you can, you know, the point is you can, you can be stylish with your hair covered. Do Americans cover their hair? Um, today, uh, nuns do, I guess. A uh, hundred years ago, many Christians did. Lutherans did, I think. It's just we're all on parallel evolutionary tracks, and some of us are farther along than others. Some of us have had a reformation. Some of us have had a Vatican II, and some of us have, are waiting for that, you know. So we've got to be a little bit patient on this. But in those Orthodox communities in Jerusalem, women who are married wear a wig when they go out. They can't show their real hair on the street. Who's upset about that? Nobody's upset about that. That's what they choose to do. But if a Muslim woman wants to cover her hair, a lot of American Christians get all upset about it. So I just think that's a little bit of cultural naivety. So it's an exciting place to travel. And um, uh, when we think about it, <clears throat> we're stakeholders. We're involved. If there's joy, we're part of it. If there's heartache, we're part of it. I remember on my first trip to Central America when I was a kid, my dad said, he said, son, don't be duped. I was going down there to learn about it firsthand. And my dad was worried that I would be duped as he stayed home and defended his worldview shaped by television. It's ironic, isn't it? It's so interesting. You've got to go there to understand it. That's what I believe. If you care about these things, you need to go there. I'm excited about Israel. Nobody can say I'm not pro-Israel. I just believe the best thing for Israel would be to give Palestine dignity. <laughs> because it could be done. We could do a lot of things. If we spent as much as our president wants to spend on that wall, <laughs> helping Palestine have dignity with the precondition that Israel will be secure, no threat to Israel, to give kids in Palestine reason to hope and play by the rules. No threat at all. That's an opportunity. I'm inspired by the olive trees in the Holy Land. Right there next to the wall. These are symbols of steadfastness. It's called the tree of the poor. It, it, it gives without taking. It's a tree famously painted, planted by grandparents so their grandkids, long after the grandparents are gone, will eat. And kids today plant it so their grandchildren, long after they're gone, will eat. When we travel, we learn. When we travel, we think, what is the solution? And the big issue, I think, is how do we sort this out? I think there's three possibilities for Israel. A two-state solution where both sides are, um, have dignity and security, guaranteed by the United States if necessary a two-state solution or a one-state solution. If you have a one-state solution, it's either going to be a democracy or an apartheid state. There's no alternative. You've got to choose. You can't hope for anything else. Two states or one state. If it's one state, it's free and democratic or it's apartheid. Now, if it's free and democratic, within a generation, you're going to have more Palestinians than Jews. And you're not going to have a Jewish state on this planet. I think there should be a Jewish state on this planet, personally. Be nice if, well, I, I guess, I just think it's doable if people want to have a Jewish state, but they're going to have to. Well, if, if they don't have democracy in that two-state setup, they're going to have to keep down four million Muslims. You cannot wish them away. You cannot wish them away. What's fascinating to me is we all have the golden rule. <laughs> Love your neighbor. It's so fundamental. You could trust that we could sort this out. There's enough money. That's not an issue. It's just we've got to work on this. And I just show another cleverly photographed American embassy as I was driving by, freaking out the driver. But the United States is there. We Americans don't realize what a heavy hand we exercise on this planet in so many ways. And if it was a good hand, it might be a good thing. But it's a responsibility. And as taxpayers, I think we need to pay attention. I had the beautiful opportunity to meet Mitri Raheb before I was into all of this stuff. 
and he is, every story you hear about him is so, it just resonates if you've met with him. I stayed right in their complex. He runs an amazing uh, compound, uh, and, and this uh, 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 is, a, is, a, is a university, it's a cultural center, it's a house of uh, togetherness where young people, Christians and Muslims in that community can come and not be political. It's an attempt to stop the brain drain. A brain drain in a country like Palestine is so tragic. And if your child was really hardworking and had great potential, it would be reasonable for them to go to America, I think, given the status quo. But there is an opportunity to give them reason to stay there. And we're supporting this center with Bright Stars of Bethlehem today. You know, this has been a huge success already considering how much all of you have generously paid to be here. I'm so thankful for that. And we've got a chance to think about these people, the 500 kids. It's a small part of Bethlehem. It is Palestine. It is the future. And each one of these kids wants to stay there. They want to make a difference. They want to celebrate who they are. They want to be peaceful. I know they want to be peaceful. And we together can help that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.